when you then started on the producing side is where I first then saw your name again, but I always would see it as like Q Goodman um, in the credits. When I first started noticing it and I had to figure out that that was you, that was Quran. So why did you go by Q Goodman instead of putting your full name in there? What songs did you see Q Goodman on? Like the Method Man, Breakups to Makeups? Nah, I should say Karan Goodman on there. You probably seen the publishing. Oh, okay, as a writer, yeah. Yeah, that probably was the writer's credits you was looking at. But under the production credits, it say Karan Goodman. So then when, when did you and why did you use Cue Ball? Cue Ball was a nickname given to me. Tim Sin. And I never even used cue ball. Everybody else would call me cue ball. I never picked that name and was going around calling myself cue ball. That was a name that certain people around me started calling me. And then it just evolved into, you know, me putting it in rhymes and, you know, it be, you know, came to me saying I was cue ball after all that, you know what I mean? Okay. So then how did you get with uh, Tone and Poke and end up getting the Method Man's breakups to makeups? I met Tone and Poke in Miami at Gloria Estefan's studio with uh, Charlie Mack. Man, shout out to the legendary Charlie Mack, man. Charlie Mack took me over to Gloria Estefan's studio at the time when they was working on the Firm album. So it was Nas, Dr. Dre, Tony Pope, Steve Stout, and who else was in there? I forgot. I think Nature was in there, if I ain't mistaken. But that's how I met Tony Pope in Miami. I actually met Dr. Dre as well. He gave me his contacts and all that too, but I could never get that nigga on the phone. <laughs> so I winded up, you know, resorting to trying to get with Tony Pope. And coincidentally, a girl from around my way was working for them and was their like secretary, literally. So she would tell me like, yo, they're going to be at such a studio tonight at eight o'clock. You know what I'm saying? Like giving me all the locations for me to pop up on them because I could never get them back on the phone after I met them in Miami that, you know, first time. So I would pop up, I was popping up on them at sessions they would be having at, at certain studios with my music. And then one day I got in there and it's crazy because I was actually in a nature session. We like, we bombed and crashed a, nation, a nature session. We just popped up and walked in there. I can't even remember how we got in there, but we just walked up in there. I think we got in the, in the uh, studio some type of slick way. I think we lied to the, the people at the front test and said we were supposed to be on the list or something, something like that. But we snuck in a nature session and nature was in there working on, you know, a song, whatever. And then Pope popped up at the session. And that's when we like, yo, man, we want y'all to hear our stuff. And when we put it in, the whole room went crazy. Like, yo, who made the beat? So that's when Pope, like, yo, hit me up, nigga. Like, we looking for producers, like, you know what I mean? So that's how the whole track Master Connect came about. So with breakups to makeups, it, uh, at least from what I know, it seemed to be different in the sense it was, you know, had the guitar and all the different feel of it sonically. So what what made you explore this different area uh, of, of sound? It's crazy because when I make beats, I don't pre, it's not premeditated. I don't say, you know what, I'm gonna make a beat with this type of sound. I just like do whatever comes natural. As I'm going along, I just build the beat as I'm going along. Whatever the first melody is that pop in my head that sound dope, I lock that in, start dressing, and I start dressing it up with drums, snares, hi-hat, strings, 
bass, you know what I mean, percussions, whatever, you know what I mean? But um, the Method Man beat, like I said, I just was making beats, and that was, you know, a certain joint that I wound up making. And then after Tone and them had signed me, they would be playing all of their producers' beats for certain artists that was coming to them for, for tracks. They were so busy, like they was vice presidents of Columbia at the time, Sony. They was working on all kinds of big time artists like R. Kelly, Mariah Carey, uh, Nas, fucking, I can't even name all the people they was working with, like major people, LL Cool J. So they, they didn't have time to be hands on with everybody that was coming to them for beats. So they wound up creating a little crew of other producers underneath them signed to them. And they would play their beats in whatever session, I mean, meetings they would have with artists coming to them for beats. And if they would pick them, they would wind up, you know, letting them use the beat, dumping it, mixing it. And they would just put their names on the credits along with the real producer that made the beat. So that's how it happened with Breakups to Makeups. Tony Polk had my music on deck. They would play it in all kinds of meetings. They would be in with artists. And Meth had a meeting with them. Because, you know, of course, they made the All your all I Need song with Mary J. Blige and Meth, legendary All I Need. Shout out to my nigga Meth, the fucking thing, man. Love you, boy. So Meth came back to him for another banger on the next album he was working on. And as Pope was playing them, all of my beats, he picked that one. It blew my mind when Pope first told me, like, yo, oh, yeah, met the man, picked one of your beats. He using it for his album. I'm like, damn, yeah, which one? When he played that beat, I thought he was lying. I'm like, man, this nigga lying. Nothing picked that track. This nigga lying, man. Because I couldn't hear a meth on a beat like that. And then they played it for me like a couple weeks later. I'm like, oh, shit. But the original version of Breakups to Makeups was literally one verse. It was just one long verse for like two minutes straight. Meth just rapping straight. No chorus or nothing. And then we winded up breaking them you know, the verse up in the three different parts and then bring in D'Angelo to do the chorus. But the original version of Breakups to Make Up was one long verse. That all them verse, all the lyrics you hear on that song, they, they wasn't spread it out at first. It was all straight, you know what I mean? Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.